very happy to be here and we're very happy to be presenting together because we've never got to do this before. Uh, Bill's been a friend of mine for a while and we have a mutual interest in telomerase and as a matter of fact he's the specialist and I'm the entrepreneur. I'm the person trying to get these technologies to you. And this morning the talk was great because we talked about an aging population, we talked about innovation, the problems with regulation, and all of that coming together is much of what I deal with every day. So did you know that every day over 100,000 people die of aging? That's a lot. That's three million a month. It's the biggest catastrophe. That's the biggest epidemic on the globe. But it's not until recently that we've actually had the bandwidth to realize that, in fact, this is something um, really encumbering uh, the human race. We've had our hands full. As a matter of fact, just a couple hundred years ago, we didn't predominantly die of aging at all. We died of infectious disease. Humans naturally die of infectious disease. We don't die of old age. Very few, very few, like one to three percent of people used to die of old age. There were no names for those diseases. So, a cure for aging, that sounds really science fiction-y, but it's really science fact. And as the video pointed out, this has been done in animals, and it's been done in human tissue, and now we're trying to do it in humans, and I'll tell you why. So these up here are the symptoms of biological aging or the diseases of biological aging. These are the things that we die of predominantly now in industrialized countries. As a matter of fact, a third of this room is set to die of heart disease, the other third is set to die of cancer, and the rest will be lucky enough to pick something else off of this map. Sarcopenia will wreak havoc in all of our lives if we live over 65. That's muscle loss over time. This leads to things like frailty and broken hips, infirmary. Right now we have a very reactive healthcare system. We haven't been able to produce or generate many cures. As a matter of fact, the big bump in human lifespan is because of immunizations and antibiotics. That's why we live this long uh, to see these new prevailing diseases uh, encumber our lives. So how do we innovate in a very <coughs> tough circumstance of regulation and start tackling these diseases now? these diseases that are highly costive to society. As a matter of fact, the, the costs are increasing every year of these aging diseases. So, you know, certainly we'd all like to mitigate disease and we'd like to live a long, healthy life. But it's not just solely a self-importance at this point. It's an economic crisis we're headed towards. So by the year 2020, this is coming up on us very quickly. There'll be more people on the globe, the whole earth, over 65 than under five. The under five-year-olds go on to be 15 and then 25. They become the workforce for the 65-year-olds who turn 75 and 85 and up. We actually can't afford the cost, and most of these young children are not coming from our industrialized countries. The healthcare system looks like sometimes a hundred persons stacked on top of one five-year-old that will be um, responsible for the, the costs associated. And as a matter of fact, by 2050 in the U.S., it's projected that at this rate, 40 percent of the GDP will be spent on these aging diseases. What if we could get the health back for these people? What if we could keep them in the workforce? What if we could keep people viable and youthful and strong? It's a real game changer. If people are retiring at 65, but some people will live the maximum of 120 <coughs> years, what will they live on? What will be their contribution? We can see here that the population over 100 years of age is going to increase by 1,004%. And on one hand, you might feel really great about that. You'll, you're more likely to reach 100 than ever before in the history of mankind. But you're going to run into 100 being infirmed and sick and with a lot of debt. 
As a matter of fact, we'll spend 80% on everything we spend in healthcare in the last year of our life, and with this prolonging of what I would consider unhealthy lifespans due to the lack of uh, therapeutics, that can actually be exacerbated up to 10 years. So, okay, we definitely want to solve this problem. So what would curing aging be? Certainly we're not talking about curing chronological aging. We want to talk about curing biological aging. And I'm going to turn to the smartest man in the room on that and hear from him. I'll grab the mouse. So I'm going to be talking about telomeres. <clears throat> and I want to first point out that the 1,004% is not going to be because of the efforts of mine and Liz. It, that's going to happen anyway. And the problem is, is that everybody's going to be unhealthy because they're not, we're not going to be really improving the health of the older people. And the number one focus we want to do is we want to improve health and uh, life extension is a side effect of keeping people healthy. So telomeres is a brand new field of science, a uh, very exciting field. Uh, <clears throat> it's, mostly unrelated to everything else you've ever heard of, unless you already know about telomeres. But what I want to do is I, 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 I want to go through the basics of what telomeres are, and a lot of people already know this, but I know from the cocktail hour, night before last, and stuff like that, I did meet people that have no idea what these are. So I'm going to go over very carefully what telomeres are so everybody here is on the same page. And telomeres are things that are very small inside of us, and <clears throat> They, you know, when we zoom in on a human being, we first see that a human is made up of a hundred trillion cells. And pretty much this is going to be a recap of what you just saw in the Immortalist movie. And most of the theories on why we age say that we age because these cells age. And so what we have to do is we have to find a way to prevent these cells from aging. So most of the research that gets done in my company, which is called Sierra Sciences, is to look at human cells growing in a petri dish. And then this is later extrapolated to bigger things. So we zoom in even further, we see that every cell contains a nucleus, as most of you already know. And the nucleus contains these blue things called chromosomes, where the genes are that give us our hair color, eye color, everything like that. But it's made up of a long single strand DNA molecule. When we look at one chromosome now, it's, there's two DNA molecules. And two arms. There's a bottom arm and a top arm. And <clears throat> these arms each contain a very long string of beads called DNA, which typically is about 100 million bases in length. Uh, bases are units of DNA. And it, think of it like a really long shoelace, except to fit inside this chromosome, it's all coiled up like a slinky. Okay, on your shoelaces, you have these caps. And the caps protect your shoelaces from falling apart. Well, chromosomes have the exact same thing, and they're called telomeres. Telomeres shown here in yellow. Those are what telomeres are. Now, it's part of the DNA molecule. It's wound up like a slinky. If we unravel that slinky in the telomere, we find that a telomere is about 15,000 bases in length. Remember, it's chromosome is about 100 million bases in length. So telomeres are pretty small things, but they're super, super important. And there are 15,000 bases, at least when we're first conceived. And then here's where all the troubles begin. When your cells divide, and each and every time your cells divide, the telomeres will get a little bit shorter. And <clears throat> so there's a lot of cell division that occurs from the time you're a single cell embryo to newborn baby, that by that time your telomeres have shortened from 15,000 to 10,000 bases, a tremendous shortening of your telomeres. And the problem doesn't stop there. I mean, still it's okay because it's just like cutting the caps on your shoelaces in half, the shoelaces are still okay at that point. But they get shorter because we have to grow up, become adults, and that's going to take lots of cell divisions. So after t years and years and years of cell divisions, your telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And when telomeres get down to 5,000 bases, your cells lose the ability to function. They enter a phase called senescence. And when you have a lot of senescent cells, that's when you die of old age. And let me go over that again. It's conceived at 15,000 bases, born at 5,000 bases, die of old age at 5,000 bases. I think I said that right. <clears throat> and 
This is not a theory anymore. This is solid fact. My colleagues won the Nobel Prize in medicine for discovering this. The, uh, uh, every lab in the, who does cell culture is aware of this problem. It, this, when the it, telomeres get really short, it induces something called the Hayflick limit, where human, when scientists trying to work on human cells in a petri dish, they can't work with them very long because every time the cells divide, the telomeres get shorter. When they reach 5,000 bases, they have to throw the cells away and get new cells. And so <clears throat> this is a big problem. And what's really important is that even though I've been interested, as I said in the mortalist, I've been interested in aging my entire life, I've always been uneasy. I just, twos and twos didn't add up when I heard every theory about aging, mostly related to the environment, whether it's internal or external. Something was wrong, because why do people who live on the North and South Poles age at the same rate as people who live on the equator, when the environments are very different? Why do cats and dogs age at different rates than humans when they're in the same environment? They're, they're, the, the environment didn't add up. I'm, I'm sure environment has something to do with it, but it doesn't explain the whole story. I decided there had to be some kind of clock that's ticking inside of us. And in 1992, I was attending a conference like this, and I heard a scientist talk about the fact that telomeres get shorter. So I jumped on that bandwagon instantaneously. <clears throat> now, it's not just aging we're talking about. As we said before, we're talking about health in general. But now, every disease I've ever heard of has now been published in scientifically peer-reviewed journals showing that the length of your telomeres affects your ability to get them, including things like the common cold. And that's because our immune system is very sensitive to telomere lengths. When we go into immune senescence, it's because the telomeres get short. Animal studies have now shown that you can make the immune system strong again by lengthening the telomeres. But the point is, is that every disease is affected by the length of your telomeres. And some of these have been shown to be uh, affected by the telomeres. Some have been still suggested we don't know a cause and effect yet. But I believe that there's a lot of benefit that's going to be gained when we figure out a way to lengthen telomeres in humans. And <clears throat> I want to point out at this point, we're not really a medical device group of people. Okay, so I assume we're here mostly to, for entertainment. But <laughs> I, I do want to say that, that uh, measuring the telomere lengths is something that's going to be a big business pretty soon. And, and there already is several companies doing this. I, I, say that I, I would say personally, there's it's got to be tremendous improvements in the system. Okay, but this will be a big business for medical devices, I think, in the future of being able to take a blood sample or any kind of tissue sample and measure the length of the telomeres. So you all would keep that in mind while I focus on trying to figure out how to lengthen them. Uh, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> so the question I want to ask now is, and this might help you in trying to figure out how to develop a device, why did the telomeres shorten to begin with? Well, I said every time your cells divide, they get a little shorter. Well, why is that? Okay, it's because people think it's something chewing them away, but it's, it's actually mostly not that. There's a little bit of that, but it's mostly not. And so what I want to do is I want to use an analogy. I'm, I could spend all the time talking about DNA replication and Okazaki fragments and RNA primers and things like that, but instead of talking about all that with DNA replication, I just want to use an analogy of a brick wall. So you've got a cell, and it's going to divide to make two daughter cells. Well, everything inside that cell has to be duplicated first so that the two daughter cells have everything that the parent cell had. But that includes this long chromosome, this 100, 100, 100 million base chromosome. So I want you to think of the, uh, so the DNA has to, to, has to be replicated, duplicated or replicated. Think of the DNA replication as making a new row of bricks on a brick wall. Think of the top row of bricks as the chromosome Cell is going to get ready to divide, so it's got to make a new copy of itself. And you have a brick layer, in the case of the cell, it's called DNA polymerase 1, and it goes along and makes a copy. So let's get rid of the other bricks and get rid of the cat. And now the brick layer comes along, and he's laying a new row of bricks. <clears throat> and this happens throughout the chromosome. It's 100 million bases, as I said. It's got to be accurate. Uh, any inaccuracies will lead to mutations, etc. <clears throat> and it's, it's just a long, tedious process. 
even though it's going on in several places at the same time. What we want to really see is what's happening over at the very end of the chromosome, at the telomere. And we find that there's a very unfortunate decision that cells made, and that was to put this bricklayer on top of the wall because you can't lay a brick in the last place you were standing, and you fall off the wall. Okay, what happened here now is this new chromosome is shorter. And this is why chromosomes get shorter every time a cell divides. It's because the new chromosome, you can't duplicate the very tip of the chromosome. The DNA polymerase one literally falls off and leaves the tip of the chromosome bare. So the new chromosome is shorter. This happens every time. Okay, the cell is going to divide again. Again, the bricklayer comes along. <clears throat> and again, the bricklayer is going to fall off time after time. The telomeres are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about this yet. No matter how well you eat and exercise, do everything your doctors or yourselves tell you to do, you cannot stop this. I call this basal level telomere shortening, meaning this is a rate of telomere shortening that you can't go slower than at the moment. Of course, that's what me and Liz are trying to figure out how to solve. Okay, so <clears throat> this is one thing. Now, if you are so inclined that you want to accelerate your aging, that's easy, okay? Anything related to an unhealthy lifestyle, uh, let's say psychological stress, obesity, smoking, lack of exercise, name it. All these things cause the generation of free radicals that will actually cleave your DNA and make it short and faster. Now, I'm going to come back to this, but these are things that, that you want to do um, uh, every, uh, as much as you can to keep your telomeres long. You want to meditate. You want to de-stress. You want to quit smoking if you're smoking. You want to lose weight. You want to uh, take a lot of different things like anti-inflammatories, antioxidants. Uh, all these things without them will cause you to have accelerated telomere shortening. So <clears throat> this is where this enzyme telomerase comes in. This is when I first got in the field, I discovered this enzyme, or my team discovered this enzyme called telomerase. It's an enzyme that will actually lengthen telomeres. And so since the middle, beginning of the 1990s, we've been actually able to lengthen telomeres and show that telomere shortening wasn't just a result of aging. It was a cause of aging, because when we lengthened them, human cells in a petri dish became younger by every method of measurement imaginable. I'll come back to how we're doing this, but this is, this is an important enzyme. So I want you to, as I said in the in more list, there's two things, telomeres and telomerase. Telomerase is the enzyme that lengthens the telomeres. This is just showing a cartoon. The telomerase enzyme is shown as a factory here, adding bases onto the very tip of the chromosome. <clears throat> so you've got the shortening and the lengthening going on. So let's go back to this bricklaying model. And what is happening here? is in cells that produce telomerase, that brick layer is still going to fall off at the end of the wall. But shortly thereafter, like an angel, telomerase comes in and replaces that brick. So this is happening inside of any cell that's producing telomerase. Now, I want you to think about the fact that if you have low levels of telomerase, then not, that brick won't be replaced every single time. It will just be replaced some of the times. So telomere shortening will still occur, but just at a shorter rate. And then we have also found that if we actually produce lots of telomerase inside of a cell, every brick gets replaced, but even more so, that angel starts making that new row of bricks longer than the old one. And that's when age reversal starts occurring. That's when we've seen in my studies in human cells, and I'll come back to that in a minute. <clears throat> so I want you to think of this as a tug of war. You've got shortening and lengthening going on at the same time. That, so even though the cell is producing telomerase, that telomere still gets shorter, but then telomerase later comes in and re-lengthens it. So you've got this tug of war, shortening, lengthening, shortening, lengthening. So you have the shorteners on one side and the lengtheners on the other side. Now, in all of us, the normal thing is we don't have any lengtheners. Every cell in our body just has these shorteners. 
So we had this tug of war going on, this continually getting shorter and shorter. And the shortening is, shortening is when? When we die of old age. Or we get cancer, heart disease, or all these other diseases that have been associated to lengthier telomeres. Now there are things, as I mentioned, antioxidants, vitamin D, exercise, things like that, where you can reduce the number of shorteners. But you can't reduce it more than what I call that basal level of telomere shortening, where there's still like two people pulling. It's slowing down the rate of shortening, but it's still occurring. And it turns out that if you, do, if you have the perfect genetics and leave the healthiest, healthiest of lifestyles, you can slow this down to about 50 to 100 bases per year, and that will allow you to live to be 125, but not any longer. There's no way that, there's no recorded, in recorded history, there's nobody has ever lived longer than 122 so far. So you are still limited and your health declines. Even the 122 year old person was very unhealthy. My goal is to make certain that we all are playing tennis, dancing, having the time of our lives when we're 150 and older. Okay, so that's one way to reduce the shortening. Now, the, the way that we are working on is to add lengtheners, and that's the enzyme telomerase. It's the only normal way to do it. There's other procedures called alt pathways and things like that that have occurred in some type of cells, but the way we can do it without causing mutations to our cells is do adding lengtheners, and that's by the enzyme telomerase. So there are products already in the market that do stimulate a little bit of telomerase, and it's essentially to having one lengthener against two shorteners. Well, the shortener is still winning, okay? There isn't a product on the market right now that will lengthen telomeres, to uh, cause the net result of length. They do lengthen them, but not enough to overcome the shortening. So it just slows the shortening rate of down, which is still good. So I encourage everybody to do everything they can to get there, to decrease the number of shorteners and increase the number of lengtheners. Now what my company is doing research on and Liz's company is doing research on is trying to add more lengtheners. And eventually when we can get to a tie, that should stop aging if humans are anything like their cells in a Petri dish, because it's worked really well in human cells in a Petri dish and some other things I'll mention in a minute. Now, <clears throat> what we really like to do is add even another lengthener. And this way, the lengtheners win, okay? The telomeres get longer and the shorteners lose. And this is when we expect to see age reversal. And the only way so far that anybody, and any scientist in the whole world, has been able to solve, to be able to do this, is through gene therapy. My company's working on other approaches and hopefully someday we'll have that there too, but right now the only way to catch your telomeres longer is through the process of gene therapy. And with gene, we've been doing gene therapy in my lab since the 1990s, and we have one, okay, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about all this stuff, but I wanna make it clear that anybody who's doing anti-aging research consider these major milestones major problems that have to be solved if you actually want to cure aging. One is extend the Hayflick limit. I could spend half an hour talking about what that is, but <laughs> it's, we actually, with gene therapy, delivering telomerase to cells, actually have exceeded what's called the Hayflick limit, which is a major milestone in aging. We did this actually in the 1990s. We also reversed aging in human tissues. We grew human skin on the back of a mouse and treated it with telomerase and found that the skin became younger in every way imaginable, every method of measurement imaginable. Dr. Ron DePinnell at Harvard, using gene therapy, turned extremely old mice into young mice. You can Google this, you can find it. In fact, there's a lot of information I'll be talking about more where you can get more information about this. But this has actually been successful so far. And what was surprising in all this, he was able to show that every other theory about aging ended up being reversed just by lengthening the telomeres. Oxidative stress, mitochondria dysfunction, you name it. All these other things disappeared. So it's like he called it, telomeres are the kingpin. Now Dr. Rhonda Pennell is not just any kind of quack or charlatan because the field of anti-aging is just filled with them. He's the head of MD Anderson at Texas. I mean, he, he's a very respectable scientist. So now, he's done, we and he have done all this 
but nothing else has ever done this. You keep th hearing theories about, or people saying they've cured aging, but all they've done is like increase the energy of the mitochondria inside of a mouse cell or something like that. That's not reversing aging. We're not reversing aging until until we see a 90-year-old person walk in a room here and look 24 and act 24 again. That's when we've cured aging. That's what Liz and I are, are trying to do. So nothing else has ever done this. <clears throat> and with that point, Liz, tell us how you're going to make us all benefit from this. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what gene therapy is. Is anyone familiar with gene therapy? Yeah, it's been in the news a lot more uh, lately than it had been for, for quite a few years. Uh, with gene therapy uh, today, we take a human gene, our target gene, in this case the gene that creates telomerase, and we put it into a vector, and that vector uh, then is injected into you, and it delivers the genes to the cell, and then the cell starts making the, the target enzyme, uh, the telomerase. And so it's a very um, elegant science. Uh, this is a, the, the wave of the future. I believe that this is how we will get most of our medicine in the future. Much like in immunizations and antibiotics, uh, we'll be going for gene-boosting therapies, and they will be real preventative medicine. So how are we going to do this? This is my company's logo here. My company is BioViva, and we're a gene therapy company that treats biological aging as a disease. We're teaming up with uh, Bill at Sierra Sciences and uh, his many years of uh, science uh, behind this uh, therapy, uh, actually essentially founding the science beyond, behind this therapy, and Chase Life Extension Foundation. These are colleagues of ours in New Zealand, and they are very ambitious and motivated to help us uh, create the technology and the platform of the future where you can come to get therapeutics. We are coming together to create BioViva Fiji. So this is our, our new strategy for opening a clinic uh, to the world uh, to give them access to these therapeutics. This is a place where we can run trials on uh, telomerase-inducing gene therapies and see how they mitigate the diseases of aging and hopefully restore the human body to a youthful state and move the therapeutics into consensual care and preventative medicine. So today, gene therapy is raising millions of dollars, and there's actually no wonder why. Pharmaceuticals to date in the last 50 years have created 97% of amelioration of disease through their products. That means we're just treating symptoms. Uh, the last speaker was talking about a reactive healthcare system. We wait until people get sick, and we give them drugs that <clears throat> only moderately help their disease. As a matter of fact, the efficacy of most drugs that go through the FDA is rather low, with some of our most promising cancer therapies only affecting 30% of the population. I don't have that slide on this, um, this uh, reel, but I do have it if you want to see it. 97% uh, of non-cures, and yet in the last year, we have six potential cures for disease in the pipeline using gene therapy in one year. We find the gene, we target it, we put it in the cell, the cell becomes the drug factory creating what you need to be healthy. And right now, most of the drugs going through are actually for treating cancer, which is fantastic, 42% of them, and the rest are generally for monogenic orphan diseases. Uh, monogenic means there's one gene that's the target issue, like adrenaleukodystrophy. This is the one that says Lorenzo oil disease. This is a disease in young males, about one in every 21,000. But it's fatal. And by delivering the proper gene, these kids live. It's very exciting. This industry, by uh, the year 2025, will be an $11 billion industry in the US alone. It's, it's, it's fantastic. The future looks bright. The future looks beautiful. A lot of the questions that I get is, doesn't telomerase cause cancer, okay? And of course, I don't believe that it does, but we're going to, again, defer to the expert. Thank you. <clears throat> let, me, let me start off with, I think one of the main reasons why there are people out there that think that telomerase causes cancer is because when I, 
my team first discovered telomerase, we, we first put it into human cells, skin cells in a petri dish, and it showed that they got younger. But we also put the, what's called the antisense into cancer cells, and it showed that we could kill every cancer cell by um, uh, causing it to die of old age. I was actually awarded second place for uh, National Inventor of the Year for that discovery. Well, when people started hearing this, they started saying, well, if inhibiting telomerase uh, kills cancer cells, then telomerase must be the cause of that cancer. But it's not. Now, I can actually spend an hour talking about this, and I do speak at cancer conferences and stuff like that and go over this great detail with doctors explaining exactly this. And, and believe me, every one of them knows after I get done talking that telomerase does not cause cancer. But I just want to quickly just summarize a few key relevant points. There is no clinical data whatsoever published anywhere that shows that telomerase causes cancer. The data all shows that lack of telomerase causes cancer. We already get cancer, and it's because our telomeres get really short. And when our telomeres get really short, it induces chromosome rearrangements. We can have tens of hundreds of mutations, rearrangements in every cell in a cancer population because of the short telomeres. This has been published a lot in 2015 and 2016 that short telomeres <coughs> cause all the mutations that lead to cancer. So keeping telomeres long is the really important thing. And <clears throat> let me just say that for every study that's ever suggested, in fact, no study, except maybe sometimes you read in the discussion section where they'll just refer to an old study, no study has been published that even suggests that telomerase causes cancer since before 2005. But for every study that suggests that telomerase might cause cancer, there are hundreds of studies that show that the lack of telomerase does cause cancer. And this is something, so we now know, and there's lots of literature supporting this, that, so for this, I'm bringing this up because some of you may have heard somebody say telomerase causes cancer. I want to tell you, there's no data, nothing suggesting it. And actually, all the data suggests exactly the opposite. If we produce telomerase inside of our cells, we're going to decrease our risk of getting cancer. We're going to increase our ability to fight cancer if we already have it by lengthening the telomeres in our immune cells. And we're also going to be able to allow our bodies or our cancers to not adapt to any kind of changes. When you, when you treat a cancer with something like a chemotherapy or whatever type of thing, with all these mutations occurring, one or two of those cells are going to figure out a way to survive whatever you're hitting them with. But if you keep the telomeres long, they won't. So, this is, so three things. One is it <clears throat> decreases the risk of getting cancer, increases your ability, body's ability to fight the cancer, and increases your chances that the cancer will not come back. So these are really, really important. And so do you want to talk about anything else? Because I can talk hours on this one. Do you want to talk about anything <laughs> else that people say we shouldn't be doing this? I just think that there's, a, there's been a lot of uh, critics and concerns about uh, healthy lifespans. Uh, our job is health. Uh, the other issues uh, we certainly can solve with time. Um, I think that that's most of what I want to say. Of course, I want you to consider your most important currency, one that you've probably not considered before, and that is time. And we hope to lengthen yours, your healthy time here on Earth. Let's see, what, what sort of information do we have? Well, there are people that say things like, won't the world be overpopulated if we cure aging? And then there's others that say, how will the young ever get jobs if uh, the old never get weak and feeble? The old, the old people, they're just going to get better and better and better because they're still going to be really young. And the, the young one never be able to get jobs. There's all these kind of problems. There's, there's also people that are saying that religious groups might be very opposed to this. It turns out the Catholic Church actually published a chapter in my book supporting it, saying it's, this is part of what they want to see happen. But it, it's, there's a lot of these kind of things going on. And, and I don't know, my personal belief on the thing is that if we, when, let's not say if, when we have a cure for aging, a hundred years later, the world's suffering from every kind of problem you can imagine occurring. Nobody is going to say, let's vote to ban the cure for aging, because the cure for aging is going to be good. If it's going to be good then, I'm thinking it's going to be good now. It's worth doing. Okay, we already have major problems, and a lot of the problems, like what Liz was talking about, something called the silver tsunami, where we're just getting a lot of old people, 
Those are really big problems because who's going to care for these people? I think the number one profession 30 years from now is going to be taking care of the old people unless Liz and I succeed at what we're doing, when we succeed at what we're doing. <laughs> exactly. So to learn more, um, I do have a book uh, called Cure and Aging. It's available on Amazon.com. Uh, it, it mostly is answering all the kinds of questions that people ask when we get done talking. Uh, you can also watch The Immortalist, as you saw. There's a, it's actually a, like two hours long, I think. It's, it's, so it goes into a lot more detail than what you just saw. And then there's our individual websites that you can go to, uh, bioviva-science.com and crsi.com to learn more. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Your first review comes from my mom who found you fascinating. Oh, good. Where's, where's no offense, you? Joe, but uh, yeah, she was all over this. Um, so having seen your movie and getting to know you a bit, uh, I know that funding has been challenging for you with all this promise. Can you talk to us a little bit about that struggle and dot, dot, dot? Uh, let me go first here. You know, we were very well funded before the 2008 economic crisis. and. Uh, uh, we, get, we made major progress and stuff like that. And, you know, w this gene therapy is coming along really well, but it's, it's, it's not going to be affordable by everybody. And my company's mission is to find something that's affordable by everybody, and which would be a small molecule drug or natural product. And so we've been struggling trying to do that, but since 2008, it's been really difficult. We, we, we actually spent $33 million on our research up until 2008, <clears throat> and then we haven't gotten any investors. We've, We've actually taken some of the discoveries that we had, licensed them to other companies, and turned them in, they turned them into products. And we get our funding now from the royalties from that. But it's not enough to get ourselves back to where we were before 2008. And I'll tell you, we would be one year away from having a pill ready for people to take that would actually lengthen telomeres, and then we can see what happens uh, within a year after we, we get the uh, amount of funding that we need. But, you're the entrepreneur. You, you, you tell more about it because you, you're more related, closer to the problem. Right. So we, we brought in early money uh, very quickly. And then we shut down our, our search for money. And we ran the first human test uh, with these therapeutics. As a matter of fact, I was the first person to take a what would be considered a lower dose of the human telomerase activating gene therapy and a myostatin inhibitor. I took two gene therapies to treat biological aging to prove that they were safe and that we were ready to embark on treating the world. Uh, we have now uh, come back up, we've breached, <laughs> and we've partnered with a company called Deep Knowledge Life Sciences, who will be our funding uh, mechanism, and there's a lot of interest in what we're doing now, because we've certainly uh, proved some amount of safety. I certainly have been, continued to be in fantastic health. We have some preliminary data that we're weighing out uh, the benefits of, of uh, spectrocell imaging of my white blood cells that in show a potential small increase in telomere length. Um, so this is very exciting news for us, and it has created a big buzz, but of course we want to deliver on the promise uh, and not just talk about it. So we have uh, partnered with DKLS, and the second thing that we've done is I've been globe trotting around the world. And this kind of comes back to the, the first speaker. We've been uh, going around the world with world leaders, a global consortium of top personage, even people from the UK government, that are trying to help companies like mine find a regulatory zone where we can prove safety and efficacy in short order and get these therapeutics to humans. Um, this is, it's called the Global Longevity Initiative, uh, the GLI. and. Uh, we have met with presidents and prime ministers, and we continue that march, and these people are actually very receptive. They want to be innovative companies uh, and innovative countries that actually bring therapeutics to the world that show the biggest promise over anything that we've offered uh, before. Of course, we would like to start in compassionate care and then move back uh, to preventative uh, treatments. So we have a game plan. We're very hopeful about it, and DKLS is determined to help us as a company find the investment that drives the cost down on these therapeutics so we can treat more of the world within the next five years. So that's a very long answer to a quick, uh, very short question. 
So, hi, I, it was very fascinating. I just have a, a technical question about how you're getting your genes into the cells and whether you need to get it into all the cells. Otherwise, I expect you would get some, some old cells and some young cells, and what is that going to look like? Right, so Bill, can you answer the science questions? Well, we already have some young cells and old cells. Everybody, that, that because of the fact that only one chromosome gets, one, the new chromosome gets shorter and the older one stays longer, means as a result, you're going to have a whole population mixture of different things. So you've got young cells and old cells in every person. It's just the percentage of old cells over the young cells that really makes the difference. So our goal is to get every cell infected. And hopefully delivery by, through the blood is the best way to do that. But even if we don't, we think that we'll still get most of them and the old cells will end up dying and the young cells will take over. Then there's also, of course, the cells that don't divide. Those cells actually do have telomer shortening too, mostly by the uh, accelerated telomer length measurement that I saw. But they're more affected, like the nerve cells, they're affected by Schwann cells or other types of glia cells that protect them. Okay, but those cells do divide and those are affected by telomer length. But they'll die off and other cells replace those as long as we have the telomeres long in some of the cells. I appreciate the, you know, all the details and the information that you shared. It just really is fascinating. But, and, and you touched on it a little bit, but the socioeconomic factors that, mm -hmm. that you're, the problem you're trying to solve that it has on jobs, you mentioned that, but also things like social security and, and just you know, overpopulation and things like that. Can you go into a little bit more depth into that? Because I can imagine that would be an area of a lot of resistance to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it is very important. And on this presentation, we didn't really talk about that. And we do have many of those answers because it's part of being in this profession. Uh, there's not only the savings of keeping people working and active, there's actually the savings of mitigating these diseases. So the U.S. government would save about $4 trillion in one presidential term by curing these diseases. Okay, so it's kind of money in the bank that's just not having to be delved out to begin with. And I believe that Bill also addresses this in his book, that the economic savings on mitigating the diseases of aging could create an actual sabbatical, a 10-year sabbatical in the midterm of your life that the government could pay you to have, to re-educate, to re-learn, uh, or go and travel the world and be ready for that second half of life um, work uh, that you're going to be doing. So uh, there are a lot of benefits. Uh, also, we are working into a burgeoning uh, society that's looking at doing very many new things, uh, space travel and things like that, that seem like a technology of tomorrow or companies are already being funded for mining asteroids and things like that. We're looking at workforces to start to go to Mars. It seems a long ways off, but it'll be here before you know it. I'd like to talk about the overpopulation issue because in 1960, the, the, the Club of Rome got together and they decided that by the year 2000, we'd actually be eating each other, okay? <laughs> this didn't happen, and as a matter of fact, we're coming into more abundance with technology as it comes. But they created a catastrophe, catastrophe scenario for the human race, but they were something that they overlooked, and actually none of us could see it, and now we do. We see it actually very clearly. It doesn't matter where on the earth a population or culture is. It doesn't matter if they're in the middle of a jungle and you'll never meet them or they're uh, your next door neighbor. As lifespan increases, birth rates go down everywhere on the earth. We, we, this is reflected in every single place. There's a beautiful graph, again, that I don't have. Uh, to show you, but I can get you if you're interested. And it shows uh, the decline in birth rate over uh, the last uh, several, about 100 years. It's, it's staggering. This is a natural consequence of living longer. We have less children. And um, I, of course, I love children. I actually got involved in BioViva to cure childhood disease. I didn't know about things like longevity science when I got started. but. Um, this uh, creates a world where maybe every child would have a, a better opportunity in the future. So that's just a few things touched on. People will certainly still have accidents. Infectious disease will certainly still nail our populations quite hard. hard. So when I was talking about how we used to die, how we naturally die as a society, is before the age of 30 of infectious disease. That was about 90% of what happened to everyone outside of accidents and the very few that died of old age. 
In 2010, we got infectious disease down to 3%. Only 3% of the population die from it. It's considered so abnormal. And we'd just like to take the next step in science, and that is to knock off uh, the next big killers, you know, reduce the amount of suffering. And I'm sure that many of these problems that will arise from this, that many of them that we already have, will be solved with more time, with more manpower. As a matter of fact, almost every big industrial revolution did not just happen by human ingenuity, it actually happened by lifespan. Did you know that? As we increased our lifespan, we went into the first big industrial revolutions. It changed everything. So take that into consideration, and um, hopefully we're, we'll create a better world. I see that Joe's like, please stop. No, well, we, we do. I, I regret that more hands went up than we can accommodate, so we'll take one last question from David Kasich. Okay. Well, maybe this is not the best question to ask. I just wonder in your lab work, how are you measuring the effect of uh, practically of reversing of aging, do all organs age at the same rate and might we wind up in a society where brains deteriorate, you know, the, the physical body reverses aging but brains don't? I mean, is there, are there long-term, are you, uh -huh. do you have yeah. any evidence that everything in the body will reverse aging at the same rate? What, what's interesting is, of course, we have, are interested in aging all the way through, and of course, that most of the questions that we get uh, are from more of the vanity industry of, of anti-aging. You know, a lot of people say, will my skin look younger? Will my hair not be as gray? And it's really important, this is a very important conversation, because we want you to be youthful all the way through. We do have a plan to embark on. Uh, this would be almost like the 100,000 genome project, and this would be a plan where we actually MRI our patients um, uh, before and after treatment. Uh, we create a database of thousands of patients of all various ages because there's actually <coughs> biomarkers just in that. We obviously do blood work, we do telomere length testing, we have a protocol for all of that for, for kidney function and, and body function. But believe it or not, just whole body imaging of what the organs look like, what the brain looks like. I have a fantastic slide of a 27-year-old with a, you know, what we consider a healthy brain and it, next to an 87-year-old uh, who, who doesn't even have any signs of dementia and the brain <clears throat> is different. So yes, we want to go through the, the whole, through, slice through the whole body and see what that looks like. And that was what Bill was talking about with Rhonda Pino. The mice did show increase in every organ, including, including brain size. Bill, some I closing I, thoughts? I just want to say, I want to answer everybody's questions. I usually am the last person to leave a room, but I won't be able to right now because of time. But I do have business cards. If anybody has questions, you can contact me. But I'll be here for a few hours, too. But I don't want you to come in and ask me questions when somebody else is speaking. So get my business card from me, and uh, uh, you can contact Very me. Very generous with this time, question. Dr. Bill Andrews, Liz Thank Parrish. Thank you very much. Thanks.